Hey everybody, John Skiba here from the Consumer Warrior YouTube channel. And in today's video, I'm going to give you a recap of a trial that I had today. I actually had an in-person trial, something I haven't had for quite a while against a junk debt buyer. I wanna talk about kind of what happened, the ruling I got, and kind of why I think the court got to where they got. But if this is your first time here to my YouTube channel, please go ahead, click subscribe, check on that little bell. That way you'll be notified each week when I put out new videos that'll help you deal with your serious debt problem. All right, so today I found myself actually in court doing a trial, and I was trying to think back. I think the last time I did an in-person junk debt buyer trial was pre-COVID. I think it's literally been two years since I've been in the courtroom making these arguments. Now we do Zoom calls and things like that, but it's just not quite the same. I actually felt like a real lawyer again in the courtroom going up against the debt buyers. And the debt buyer I was going up against is Unifund. Unifund's a very large debt buyer. They file tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases a year across the country. But one thing that's a little bit unique about Unifund is they typically don't buy from original creditors. It usually changes hands multiple times before it gets to Unifund. And so I thought, you know, I felt it was a pretty good case to take to trial. The case didn't settle and we didn't go other routes just because of some client type issues as far as the direction they wanted to take the case. But I felt comfortable taking them because there were so many different layers and because the evidence and the documents that they had provided were wholly inadequate. There just wasn't enough information to be able to show that money my client's specific account had went from the original creditor all the way over to the junk debt buyer Unifund and that they were entitled to payment. And so trial went off. Plaintiff did their direct examination of their only witness, which was from Unifund. I did my cross-examination, went through the whole chain of title, and I thought we adequately were able to show that their witness was not competent to be able to testify as to each of those different companies for the simple reason. He didn't work for those companies and he hadn't been trained by those companies as far as how they keep and maintain their records. However, I got a bad ruling. The court came back and said that my client was liable for the debt and entered a judgment. Now, something that the judge said though, as far as kind of going through his process of why he found my client liable is something that really gives me a little bit of concern and pause sometimes. And I think it's worth talking about here. And I actually wrote it down on a piece of paper. <laughs> the judge said that while he appreciated the issues that I had raised in the trial, as far as the witness was not able to authenticate the documents, that there were gaps in the chain of title leading up to Unifund, the judge said that he felt that it was appropriate based upon the standard of practice for the industry. And the reason why this really took me back a bit is because in essence, what I'm seeing in that type of ruling is that it's almost as if the court system is adopting its practices to the internal practices of junk debt buyers. And to me, my opinion is that's opposite of how it should be. That the junk debt buyers, they have their business practices, they come to the court, and the law is what the law is. The, the rules of evidence are what the rules of evidence are. Rules of civil procedure, they are what they are. And the company, these private companies that are doing business in certain ways, if it doesn't comply with the law, then they shouldn't be awarded a judgment. But that's not what the judge said there. Again, the judge said that he felt that the information that was presented was in accordance with the standards of practice for that particular industry, for the junk debt buyer industry. And so I have a concern about that. If, if, if the court is saying, look, basically this is how they do it. They flood our courts with thousands of cases. If we were to hold them to the more strict standard that the rules of evidence require, that the rules of procedure require, then it would just really kind of bog down the whole system. And so this is just how they do business and we're gonna push this thing through. The court didn't say this, this is my opinion. It leaves my client in a position where they can appeal the case, they can still continue to try to settle it or they can file bankruptcy on it. Those are the three options they give everybody in a case like this. And so we'll kind of determine kind of how this one plays out. We'll kind of, as, as I talk to the client and we kind of figure out exactly what it is, the approach that we should take to try to resolve it. But the lesson that can be learned if you are fighting a junk debt buyer, it's worth going in and listening to the judge try another case. Try are open to the public. You can just sit in the back, listen, take notes, kind of see what the judge's thought process is because I have never heard this kind of phraseology from this judge or any other. But if I if I was going into a trial knowing that the judge essentially was just going to adopt whatever the standard practice is for that particular junk debt buyer, you would make me kind of change my advice and approach maybe on how we deal with the case, whether we're looking to settle, whether we're looking to compel private arbitration, whether we're looking to file bankruptcy if it's a larger claim, because you can end up with some bad rulings based upon things that you're not anticipating. And that's why I tell everybody, particularly in Arizona, the justice courts, they're kind of a different type of venue 
uh, many of the judges are not attorneys, although I believe this judge is. And so they come out of with a different background than if it's in a superior court uh, type setting. And you have to be ready for the unexpected. And sometimes cases turn on things that you don't anticipate that they're going to turn on, even when you feel like you presented your defense well. I've done this literally, I think I have about 400 of these trials under my belt. I feel like I know the things that are appropriate to bring up. And this one is kind of new for me. I guess I'm letting you learn from my my uh, my defeats here on this one. We're gonna have to take another angle to try to get this one resolved. And that, that's the other thing I take away. Even if you lose in the case, there's other ways to get it resolved. This thing doesn't have to be there forever, whether it's settlement, whether it's some type of negotiation, whether it's bankruptcy, you can still get it dealt with. Hopefully that's helpful if you are fighting a junk debt buyer. If you're in the state of Arizona and you're looking for some assistance, I do these types of cases. Uh, maybe I didn't give myself a very good uh, uh, advertisement with this result. But like I tell anybody, if you're meeting with an attorney and they're telling you they've never lost a case, they are lying to you. So maybe to avoid them. There's just variables in each case that lead to different results. So it is what it is. Again, we try to do our best for the client here. And this one, we're still going to try to do our best to help to get it resolved. But this particular ruling from the judge, I don't think it was right, but they're the judge. They, they issued the rule. And now we've got to make a decision going forward on how to deal with it. But if I can be of help, my information is below. I also have a lot of do-it-yourself kind of DIY things for people who are outside the state of Arizona. You can check out those courses and templates below. Feel free to give me a call. I'd be happy to see how we can help you. And thanks for watching today.